Welcome back to Believe in Colts. I'm Lawrence Owen. With me, as usual, is my guy, Gerard Powers. Gerard, it is summertime. It's been pretty nice. A little bit of rain here and there. How have you been? Ain't talked to you in a couple weeks, man. <laughs> been good, man. Still been uh, in and out on the road with this whole youth sports thing, but uh, getting ready to have a big, long break after this next weekend and a vacation. So, uh, you know, things been good. Things been steady. Summer kind of I don't want to say sneak up on you, but it kind of sneaks up on you. I mean, you know, right when school was getting ready to get out, I think it was still kind of cool outside and the weather was up and down. And then today we got a, you know, heat advisory warning about, you know, temperatures supposed to be, you know, close to 100 degrees or something like that. So summer and kind of snuck up on us. But, you know, we, we uh, we're, we're striving to be great. So I love giving me some vitamin D out there. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so. Today, we will be discussing a, a, a few points, uh, mostly about minicamp. Obviously, uh, we, we have a little bit of news that came out during that period of time. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to remind everybody out there that our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball championship finals, the NHL Hockey Finals, uh, Major League Baseball, and the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. Head over to the website or use our mobile device to sign up today, or your mobile device, don't use ours, uh, <laughs> to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get the bonus and get into all the action. Bet online where the game starts. Well, that was fun. I uh, really messed that one up completely. I'm just here. Here's my phone. Use it. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of that, uh, speaking of phones, I've actually I got a few uh, tweets in and out of uh, mini camp talking about uh, what certain players being there, certain players not. One thing I want to jump into is the second day of mini camp. Kenny Moore missed uh, something about, you know, tweaking something um, that as fans, do we look at that as kind of fishy because of the situation that he's going going through with wanting to get a new contract? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're lucky that I mean, he's basically in the building. So I'm pretty sure I mean, it was some type of minor thing that he felt. And uh, of course, when you got your star players at this point of the, I guess, season and OTAs, you're not going to do anything to stress any type of lingering injury or any new injury. So on the safe side, that's what any team would do is um, sit the guy out for the rest of mini camp. So, I mean, Kenny probably is just there so he won't get fined at the end of the day uh, because, I mean, that's what people do when you're in contract negotiations and you want more money and, you know, this or that. So the relationship probably is still good. I mean, it's not like he has any negative ill will to any coach or any player or anybody on staff. You know, this is just part of the business. Happens every year with different players. Uh, when it comes to holding out, you look around the league right now, it's a lot of people getting ready to hold out a mini camp. I want to say the wide receiver um, for, for Washington, they just yeah. came out and reported that uh, he won't be at mini camp. So, um, I'm pretty sure, like I said, Kenny's there so he don't get fined, and hopefully the little tweak that was reported is nothing serious, which I'm sure it's not uh, just a reason that he don't have to practice for, for minicamp. And then, of course, another person that didn't show up was uh, Darius Leonard. Obvious, uh, the report came out that he had surgery, back surgery. Caught yeah. so many people by surprise with this, uh, with this news. Um, and, and it's kind of odd that he says, that the doctors, the team doctors, were talking about his ankle was not at full strength. His calf wasn't, quote, unquote, firing off uh, during the season last year. And they thought that it, it was a, a, a back issue. He had a minor procedure apparently done. Now, surgery, surgery, uh, call it what you want. They're, 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 they say minor or major or whatnot. He was out the very next day, apparently, you know, out on the streets shopping, you know, walking around. So uh, that's good news. Also reports stating that, you know, there's a good possibility he may not even miss a day of training camp 
right? Uh, that if he does, it might be a week or two at most. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And, and the fact that it just came out of nowhere. Uh, definitely was a shocker. Uh, wasn't expecting to hear that. And then, of course, when you hear back, you know, that's a red flag at the end of the day because of how serious, uh, you know, that could be. Uh, but but like you say, when the reports come out, uh, he's walking around the next day out shopping and doing all that. That kind of lets you know that it was some type of minor procedure for sure, because anything serious when it comes to the back, trust me, uh, you, you're not going to be able to just walk around the next day like it's nothing. So uh, I believe the reports that came out, I believe it's a it's a minor procedure that they're just trying to make sure they correct to help everything else in his body that might be lingering from that injury or from the ankle or whatever the case. I read some things to where they were saying that, you know, one injury is starting another injury and that can be true. You know, your ankles messed up and then that kind of gets to the calf, the calf's not firing the way it's supposed to. And then all of a sudden the hamstrings not firing, then your glutes and then it's your back. So uh, it could definitely be an issue that and kind of build up and uh, happy that they're, you know, I guess taking care of it now. Uh, but the, but like you said, the reports that saying that he was out shopping and doing all that stuff the next day, it kind of lets you know that it was definitely a minor procedure because uh, anything more serious, I'm pretty sure he would have been laid up for a few days. Absolutely. Why would something like, why would they wait for so long? Like right before this point, is this just a situation where uh, Darius just hasn't been in the building and so the doctors didn't have a chance to look at him? Because there was questions rolling around all over Twitter and social media about, if he had this problem, why wait till now and risk missing time in practice? Why didn't he have it done earlier? Maybe it wasn't as serious of an issue then. Uh, you know, maybe it was something that, you know, they thought that surgery was not going to be a, a, a factor in it. You know, maybe it was some on the smaller side and, you know, as the workload increased and things start to get riled up with OTAs and guys start flying around a little bit and minicamp and all that. Maybe some popped up to where it was a little bit more serious than they thought or, or, or stuff like that. That th Those type of things, I know fans can get frustrated or get upset, you know, when you hear stuff like that come out. But literally, you know, two months ago, three months ago, it was probably something that they wasn't even talking about because they didn't. It, he might not was feeling it or it might not was bothering him or whatever the case may be. Then all of a sudden you go out there and you do something in one quick movement or one false step or anything like that could trigger it uh, or fire that thing back up. So I'm pretty sure it was something that was very small that they thought wasn't going to be an issue. And then maybe something happened in between that time and now that they were just like, man, let's just go ahead and knock this thing out so we can get back to training camp at 100%. Absolutely. Uh, some guys that have really had positive notes come out of mini camp are very similar to some of the guys that were, you know, there during OTAs. Obviously, Huge, um, <clears throat> huge pluses talked about with Matt Ryan, um, not just his accuracy, but his leadership skills uh, and, 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 you know, constantly comparing him to guys like Andrew Luck and Peyton Manning. Now, am I wrong in thinking that that's kind of unfair to Matt Ryan? to try to dis, yeah, hold him to that type of standards when you know, you know, w with, with Colts nation that we always held Andrew Luck and Peyton Manning mm -hmm. to that higher spot. Is that, is that something that we should probably back off on a little bit? You think? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I say, I mean, when you're coming, when you're talking about the coach, I mean, that's, that's, what the coats are. I mean, that's what Peyton Manning did for the coats. That's what mm -hmm. Andrew Luck did for the coats. So I don't necessarily look at it as a bad thing to be compared to the two guys that, that was one of the best quarterbacks in, you know, coach history and possibly NFL history, especially with Peyton. Mm -hmm. And I know we I know we had some great quarterbacks in our history even before Peyton, don't get me wrong. But the the last two that people just know that did it the right way is obviously Peyton and and Andrew, uh, we can throw Philip in there as well. That came in and did a great job as well. But it's just a certain standard when you think of coach football and the, the QB position. So I don't really think it's a slight at Matt Ryan that uh, everybody want to kind of hold him to the same standard as Peyton and Andrew and those things. I think it's more so should be a motivating factor for Matt. Like, man, those guys did, you know, come here and do what they supposed to do and lead teams and, you know, do it the right way. He probably feels like he he has to honor that and 
and uh, try to do those things because that's who he is uh, anyway, period. I'm pretty sure the next quarterback that's coming over there with the Falcons, he's the standard. Matt Ryan is the standard over there. And um, and and I, like I said, I think it's a good thing because if we didn't have a standard at that position, we wouldn't know what the hell we're talking about when it comes to the quarterback position. So at least we got some guys that we can revert to about how to get the job done when they're talking about quarterback play with the Colts. Another guy where, you know, there's a standard uh, you talk about with the Colts. Uh, now, during the Andrew Luck era, there wasn't a whole lot there. Uh, but obviously – uh, with Peyton Manning, he had Edger and James, right? There's a running back situation. You know, we've had a lot of very good running backs throughout the Colts history, you know, Moore and James. And and uh, I'll, I'll even put Frank Gore in there. Even though he was here for three years, he he's still a guy that came in, did it right, you know, day in, day out. Um, right now, I saw a post the other day where – Outside of Edger and James, who has nearly 10,000 yards rushing for the Colts, uh, rushing with the Colts, outside of that, the next closest is like 5,700 running back-wise for the Indianapolis Colts. Man, I I go back first two seasons, Jonathan Taylor's already got over Mm 3,000, right? But he's he's missed some time, obviously, with injury – recuperating from something you know you know uh, what the Colts have been saying um is there a chance that Taylor could could push past that I mean that it's like 5,700 yards he only needs 2,700 yards and heck he's still got two years on his rookie contract <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I definitely think that he'll eclipse it um I mean you're talking about a special talent I think Jonathan Taylor we I think we still haven't seen the best of Jonathan Taylor. I think last year kind of surprised some people. We knew he was good. Don't get me don't get me wrong. We knew he was good, but we didn't know he was ready to take on the things and uh you know the way that he did it last season. I mean last season it was a lot of I don't want to say pressure, but you know within the season like we looked to Jonathan Taylor to finish stuff, you know, to finish games, to take over games, to whatever the case may be. So um I think going into this season now, knowing who he is as a runner, knowing the style of runner that he is, knowing the leadership role, the eyes are going to be on him. Uh, he should be even more comfortable than he was last season. And I think we're going to see even – I mean, it's going to be hard to top what he did last season. I mean, it was a hell of a year. You just don't see guys with those type of rush yards. I mean, you look at Derrick Henry and what he's done with the Titans in consecutive years, just – you know, crazy numbers. I think Jonathan Taylor can can have those type type years as well to where it's just consecutive years of 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 type years. And if he's able to do that, we're not talking about best running back in just Colts history. Uh, as, the, as his years go on, we'll be talking about best running backs in the NFL, period. Well, in order to do that, obviously, you need a little bit of longevity, right? Yeah. And a lot was said when – Taylor came into the NFL because over in Wisconsin, he had a lot of carries, right? And he's had a lot of carries last year, a lot of carries uh, the year before. And before this past offseason, he never even missed a practice, never even missed a practice. And now he's missing, you know, time during this. Uh, Do we look at this offseason and and go, oh, no, you know, is is that a start of a problem? We're going to look at this offseason like, look, man, the, 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 the horses don't race today. You, look, we got other great running backs that's under you right now that needs these reps, that need to kind of find their niche and their role. Jonathan Taylor, we know your role within this offense. We know what you're going to do. You know exactly what, what you're about to do as a starter now. The other guys, we need them to get all these reps. We need them to kind of, you know, show some different things and uh, kind of assure us on what we're about to do as far as designing plays and uh, formations and packages. I mean, because, you know, you look at Hans. I mean, he's one of the guys you hear about at minicamp as well, and they're talking about the guys lining up all over the field. And then when you think of uh, Philip Lindsay, and he's more of a scat back type as well, but also another back that in ran for over a 1,000 yards in this league, we got a pretty cool dynamic when it comes to this running back position to where we know who's the bell cow. We know Jonathan Taylor is going to his, get his touches. He's going to – run between the guards, in between the tackles. He's going to be that downhill runner that he is. We're not going to try to make him be 
you know, anybody that uh that that he's not. But the other two guys, Hans and Phillip, when they get in the game, now you're going to have to think a little bit because they can line up all over the field. So I think right now for Jonathan Taylor, we need to make sure that when uh when the, the preseason get here with training camp, and uh, all those uh, type things, we want him 100%. There's no need right now to throw him in any type of rep situation to where he can kind of get a tweak here or, or something happen there. I mean, he knows the offense. He knows what he has to do this season. And I think it's more so of just making sure the best horse you got is in great shape and condition and ready for the season rather than letting him go and uh, run wild right now. Okay. Well, that's good. I, I know a lot of people have, have have wondered, you know, because of the amount of carries he's had. But this is a guy we're talking about that takes care of himself, has taken care of himself uh, physically since high school, right? You know, going and doing Pilates and 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 stuff of that nature to keep his his body limber and ready for for football. So yeah, I agree with you. I, I don't think there's really anything to look into on that on that part. I want to go back to your time while you were playing. Uh, in the NFL, I want to know what was a player's goal walking into the uh, the mandatory mini camp. What was their goal to come out of that with? Well, it's your first opportunity with the entire team uh, there, and you're going through training camp style practices. So those three days are very important, just because it's the tempo of practice, the pace of practice, the timing of plays, the execution, the format, the structure the foundation. Um, it's your last time before, you know, it really matters before every rep really counts for you to kind of iron some things out. And you want to have some reps a few days with, with your full team, your full roster, Matt Ryan throwing to the guys he's going to throw to on Sundays. Like you want everybody in the building to get those reps just to get that chemistry even more because OTAs is one speed. Don't get me wrong. I mean, your whole team can be out there in OTAs, but the practice format, it's not as fast as it is when we're talking about mini camp and and uh, training camp and things of that nature. So mini camp is that 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 first little dose of this is what to expect. Training camp. This is how practices is gonna be. It's long days. You know, you're gonna have those two hour practices. You're gonna be meeting for eight hours out the day, six five six hours out the day. You're gonna be in that building from sun up to sun down, pretty much. Uh, during those days. So it's real grind. It gives you, it gets you in that mode of what you're about to get ready to once uh, training camp start, because once training camp starts, it's that same consistent schedule until the season's over. So it's a little dose, go home, you know, tell the wife how, how, you know, the season is about to be, how the schedule is about to be, what to expect, you know, get regenerated and all those type things. And then once training camp here, at least you got an idea on how practices is uh, supposed to be in the tempo and the structure of everything. So for a rookie, mini camp is kind of that eye opener that, that, that uh, uh, this is what you're going to be uh, looking forward to uh, for the, the entire season, yes. basically. <laughs> so like, let's just say like Alec uh, Pearson, the, the, the wide receiver we got, he just went through OTAs getting full attention, like one-on-one -on -one type coaching to where, they're trying to ease you in, trying to help you understand and learn as much as you can through this slow process of OTA uh, periods. Once mini camp starts, there's no more I got time just to coach you. Now I got to coach the room uh, type thing. So now we can see who can pick up the offense, who can pick up and stay with the pace of things, who, who can understand the checks and everything that goes into install and live at practice when nobody is slowing anything down because you know you're trying to you know get guys ready for for training camp get guys ready for the season so uh it's one of those type things to where you think you got it figured out and then mini camp started and you're just like oh man i got so much more to learn so much more to study so much more things i can work on just because of the pace and and how everything is going uh you know once we know everybody is live 100 percent. awesome awesome well, one of the things that uh, – th there's actually a few people on the offensive side that I thought really stood out. Now, obviously, uh, you talk about, you know, this is – you know, mini camp is more for get getting pace, understanding how these training camp practices and stuff are going to happen. There's no there, – there's, there's no pads on, 
right? So yeah, yeah uh, no, not that cut you off. There's no pads on, which I call this part of football soccer. That's what a lot of coaches call it. You know, everybody can look good in shorts and t-shirts and all those type things. But for young guys, it is an opportunity for you to kind of take another step in making a team. If you're one of those roster guys that could be cut here, there, th these are opportunities for you to kind of show like, hey, man, like I, I can learn the offense. I am keeping up with everything. I am making the right adjustments, the right checks and doing all those type things. So it is an opportunity for young guys to kind of give those coaches th that vote of confidence going into mini camp. Uh, in order for you to make the team. Like I say, the veterans, everybody is fighting for jobs. Don't get me wrong, but it's certain levels to certain veterans on a team. It's certain guys that know that they're know that they're on the team. It's certain guys that make X amount of money that know they're not being cut. It don't matter if they have a horrible damn training camp, horrible mini camp or what. They're just not going to cut a guy and have dead money on the book if it's a lot of money. So it's certain guys with different mental I guess, uh, aspects when it comes to certain uh, levels of the organization that's going on or the process, I guess. So we're talking about mini camps. So where it's probably some young guys is like licking their chops because they get an opportunity to go against guys. That's the one like you might get a, a, a third or fourth uh, group wide receiver that undrafted guy going against the number one corner on your team. So it gives him a, a great opportunity to really show the coaches what he can do. Absolutely. I mean, that would be something, something phenomenal. You know, I mean, you, you got a, a, a wide receiver that's a, a, a UDFA going up, you know, lining up all of a sudden Gilmore's right there in front uh, of you, more, you know, more, more than likely that's what it is. I mean, you don't, you don't necessarily see a lot of ones versus ones during this period. You might have a period or two, don't get me wrong, or you might have every period, the first four reps, it's ones versus ones. Then after that, it's going to be offensive ones versus the defensive twos, defensive ones versus the offensive twos and vice versa or whatnot. But when it comes to subbing and um, and how, how many guys you got right now, the ones are not just going to sit there and get all the reps. So you might have Matt Ryan throwing to an undrafted wide receiver that's going against the number one corner and Stephon Gil Gilmore or whatnot just because of the reps and everybody's still going live speed and they expect – that undrafted guy to to know and do exactly what he's supposed to do or he wouldn't be getting that rep if that makes sense so it like i said it's a great opportunity for somebody that might not be known or somebody um uh, that might be on the bubble or whatever the case may be that you'll get plenty of opportunities during mini camp otas training camp to go against guys that's going to play on sunday and it'll give you a real good baseline on what type of player you are going forward because like i said they can only keep 53 I think they might have added a couple now. Um, uh, so everybody can't make the team. But if you got good film and you got, you know, good rapport within the organizations, within the coaches and all that, you'll be able to find a job somewhere else if you're doing what you're supposed to do. Because at the end of the day, if you're not good, everybody might not be good enough to make a team, which is understandable. But it's some guys that are good enough to make a team that might have to get cut just because of cap situations, just because of the numbers, just because of the business side of it not working out. So uh, if you're a guy that's on that bubble and you're doing what you're supposed to do, I mean, I've seen plenty of guys move on to that next uh, team and, and, and end up getting big-time deals. You look at the corner for the Packers, I forget his name, just went blank uh, right there, but he was with the Cardinals earlier that season on scout team, got cut on scout team, and the Packers just picked him up. And this guy had – seven picks eight picks this season just signed a big time extension this offseason so you just never know how it worked you just want the opportunity to kind of put some good film uh out there and go against some guys that you know that's going to play well i mean kenny moore is one of those guys right yeah, i mean exactly he, yep, he exactly. was an undrafted guy over in new england they just had too much depth didn't make the team colts picked him up and they were like wow look at the gym we got here you know <laughs> uh so it, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what you're talking about here. My 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 thing that I was going with that was, you know, they're they're not playing in pads, and yet the coach is out there saying, "Oh, we're running at full speed, 100." percent But the guys down in the trenches, they can't be running at a, a, a at truly at 100 percent without pads on, can they? Oh yeah. Like, I mean, when 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 I say we're running at a 100, percent I mean, you you are looking at it as like conditioning as well. 
So everybody's out there going full speed, running to the ball. Like you don't necessarily got to have the pads on to show that. Pads is more of a training camp type thing, make it tough and all that. But during the season, you only have on pads like maybe once out of the week, twice out of the week is most. Uh, so you're gonna you got to learn how to practice without that, putting yourself in position to make plays, doing the right techniques, because they feel like now that you're a professional, I shouldn't have to teach you how to tackle. You know, that's more of a want to. I mean, you have made it all the way up to the professional level. Tackling is one of the first things you learn as a kid to even play football. So they feel like now that you ain't got to the professional level, like, you know, it's either you know how to tackle or you don't. And more times out of not, it's an effort thing anyway. So when they say we're running 100 percent and doing that, they're trying to see who who's giving the most effort get into the ball, who's trying to put themselves in position to where they know when a coach put this on film, like, yeah, he would have made that tackle. He's right there on his hip, you know, doing things like that. So that's what they mean by the uh, – well, I guess that's what coaches look for when it comes to shirt and uh, T-shirts. Of course, you can't show your physical side because the you don't have on pads to be physical. So, uh, But you can show your effort side because uh, that's all mental. That's all a want to, and that's what they're looking for right now for sure. Okay. All right. Well, that, that – that that clears some things up because obviously, like I said, you, you can't run out there and, you know, be that kind of physical without pads. Cause that's how people get hurt, man. We, we used to do that out in the backyard and that stuff, you still get hurt, you know, and these guys are 10 times better shape and physical stature than what we were, hey, where hey. I was anyhow, you know? Uh, <laughs> and another thing to look at it that way though, as, as these professionals, like they know how to practice versus each other. They know how to not hurt their opponent i mean their their teammates and all that they kind of take care of one another when it comes to the physical side when you don't have on pads now it's still an element of physicality coming off the ball punching because you do got on like little chest protectors and shoulder protectors uh they're not necessarily shoulder pads but something to just give you some type of protection if somebody were to put hands on you so there is still some type of small physical element uh, but at that same token, uh, you are going against your teammates. So uh, guys really know how to protect themselves and protect their teammates when it comes to professional practices. Some guys that have really stood out uh, during um, mini camp. Uh, let's, let's talk about offensively. Obviously, Naheem Hines mm -hmm. apparently uh, out there lining up wide receivers for the majority of the time from from what reports, from what I'm seeing in reports. Um that's that's an interesting situation that a lot of people were hoping to hear about, you know, to, to get him more snaps. And apparently, you know, he was hit on a nice little deep fade route uh, by uh, Matt Ryan during during one of these uh, with Naheem Hines getting so many snaps at wide receiver. Is that a good or a bad thing? Because does that say, well, Hines is a good receiver? Or does that say our receiver position needs help from other positions? No, that's that's basically just saying we got a, a dynamic running back that can, you know, be a matchup problem for people. Uh, you line Hans up in the backfield and motion him out of the backfield to an empty set or to something to where a linebacker got a trail with him. At least you know what your running back can do when it comes to running a route tree, running routes and things like that. It's not often that you find running backs that's able to catch the ball from a wide receiver type uh, look or position, if that makes sense. Uh, it's, on, it's only rare. Um, so when you look at the reports about Hans, you know, lining up at wide receiver, it might be personnel packages that allows him to do that. It's not necessarily he's playing wide receiver. It's just in this personnel package, you can be in the backfield and I can send you in motion and now you're in the slot position or – whatever the case may be. I mean, you look around the league, it's a lot of, you know, different offenses when you're talking about the Sean McVay's and you're talking about uh, probably the Kyle Shanahan's and how they use uh, Debo. You know, he can line up at running back, motion out of the backfield, and now you got, you know, a linebacker guarding uh, one of your best athletic playmakers on the field. And I think that we're trying to find Hans that same similar role to where, yeah, we know you can carry the ball out of the backfield, but – you know, we can look at this as a run, too. You can line up as a wide receiver, and I throw you a quick, quick screen, and you can get seven, eight, nine yards up the field, you know, even though it can count as a pass for Matt Ryan, which I bet he loves those stats. You know, they can look at that as an offense. It's just like, look, we treat that as a run play for us pretty much. Get the ball to him in open space and dare a secondary defender, corner safety, 
to make a tough tackle on an athletic uh, running back. Another guy who's had um, positive feedback throughout this offseason so far is Paris Campbell. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of positivity uh, going his way um, to the point where it's almost like you can almost say he's been the star of, of, of this offseason so far, right? Um, yeah, even seems though, like he's having a great offseason right now. Yeah, uh, Coach uh, Frank Reich said – that he is wanting – this is that time where they want him to run all the routes, that he could play mm-hmm. all the positions, the the X, Y, and Z across the line, right? Um, is As a fan perspective, that is obviously exciting to hear. But do we got to temper our expectations because of his, his personal history? Uh, I mean, yeah, as a fan perspective – probably still a little hesitant just because you want to see him stay healthy. Uh, it seemed like that's been his only issue uh, when he's on the field. I think everybody kind of know the talent and uh, what he's capable of. Uh, but I think even him, you know, probably trying to prove it to himself that he can stay healthy, you know, and it's, it's um, when it comes to the health stuff, man, sometimes fans give players hard, a hard time. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like you mentioned, Jonathan Taylor taking care of his body. He's not the only professional athlete that does everything in their personal power to make sure they stay healthy on the field it's just sometimes when you get out there on the field stuff happens uh Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of hard to prevent certain things and i think uh right now with campbell especially with the opportunity that he has in the wide receiver room like it's kind of wide open for guys to kind of take control or be the guy uh in that room i think uh he might be looking at this year like man i just have to stay healthy and everything is going to work you know, work out in my favor. And uh, I I think, I believe that he can stay healthy. I mean, I had an injury bug uh, when I was in Indy a little bit as well. Uh, Just some freak stuff that just kept happening year in, year out. Uh, But I I believe he can stay healthy, especially, like I said, with an opportunity um, that that sits in front of him, like with with the coach. When the coach come out and say that we want you to learn every position, that means that you're, you have so much talent that we have to find ways to get you on the field. And one of the best ways that we can do that is you knowing how to play every single wide, wide receiver position that we have. Uh, it says a good thing about him, and hopefully he can just keep up this offseason that he's having and uh, and stay healthy. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's, you know, you, you talk about how he's trying to prove that to himself. I mean, it's kind of obvious that he's he's doing that with his tweets, even though he's saying, you know, it's it's out of my mind and I'm going to do this and do that with, a, with with his tweets. Him saying that in itself to me is saying, you know, he's really trying to convince yeah, himself. He knows, yeah, he you knows know? people, that's, that's the knock on him. I Like, he mm-hmm. knows that's what people are saying or whatnot. So, I mean, yeah, you say the right things and you're trying to say you're blocking out the distractions pretty much and you're staying focused and all that. But uh, I've, I've been there. I've been in his shoes. I know what, what thinking goes on when it comes to injuries and all that. And I'm pretty sure, you know, he's trying to prove it to himself. Uh, and he knows that if he does that, everybody and everybody else's opinion will change when it comes to just staying healthy. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I, I, for one, am one of those guys. I feel like that if he could be on the field for 17 games, he's a he, he's a he's a one of the most dynamic guys that I've seen in the NFL the last couple of years. He's just not been able to be on the field, and that's you know an upsetting situation for a lot of fans, not just myself. Um, flip to the other side, it's kind of odd. We talk about how you know Paris Campbell has been kind of a shining light on the offense, on the defense has been a, a, a guy basically opposite him, right? Uh, Isaiah Rogers apparently has been having um, a, a great offseason as well. Now, what do you take out of reports to, saying that Isaiah Rogers is having a, a good camp? Obviously, with Rocky Sin no longer there, that's that's important that one of those guys step up, right? Yeah, you definitely want to see Isaiah Rogers take another step in uh, development and another step in his game and – like I said, it's a good sign whenever you uh, when you hear people talking about, you know, the some of the guys that's kind of been standouts in minicamp or standouts in OTAs offseason period. And his name is being brought up for one. It just shows you the growth, the maturity. And for two, that means he's making plays. 
at the end of the day. So he's making plays. And as a secondary, you want to have guys back there that's willing to make plays and not willing to just, you know, be robotic and go through the motions or whatnot. And I think he's one of those guys that can step up and make some plays. We're obviously going to need to make sure we have as, as enough depth uh, to kind of solidify that secondary room. And I think that, you know, he's fighting for uh, some 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 playing time when it comes to when we go sub personnel and different packages and things like that. So if he could continue to progress and continue to develop and make these plays, you know, he's going to have a role on that defense. And it looked like it's going to be a fun defense. It seems like those guys are starting to figure out how they want to cause havoc up front with, with different uh, pass rushing uh, formations and, and things of that nature, which if they're able to cause some pressure, it, it will make your job in the secondary a lot easier. So maybe that's one of the reasons why he's making a lot of plays out there is the ball got to get out fast and he's able to play his game. Well, so that's something that I, I thought was a little bit interesting. You, you talk about different um, the schemes. Obviously, with Gus Bradley being in, they're, they're, they're running a, di a different type of scheme. Fans – were so, you know, upset that Matt Eberflus did not bring extra pressure, right? Uh, uh, I think the, the Colts blitz the 31st least, you know, when it comes to amount of times blitzing last year. Gus Bradley was the only one that was worse, you know. Uh, he, he blitzed even less than that. Um, but here's the thing. Gus is also he he loves the the zone defense and you know I I have been trying to wrap my head around this whole the, the Gilmore signing Gilmore is a very very good man cover corner right mm -hmm. uh, now I'm not saying he can't play zone obviously uh, but from the guys that I have talked to that have covered Gilmore for the majority of his time they say that he really excels in man. Uh, as opposed to to that, and with Gus being a zone guy, I'm hearing that Gilmore is one of those guys where, and 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 put your information in on, on this that he would play a man zone while the rest of the defense was playing zone. How does that work? I mean, it's uh, within scheme and coverages. I mean. I on certain calls, half of the field can be in man-to-man -man and the other half can be in some type of zone type call. I mean, that's that's normal within every scheme uh, around the league. Uh, you know, everybody on one specific play is not guaranteed to have the same res uh, responsibility or the same coverage or anything like that. So Gus is probably in a position now to where certain calls that he might have to where if uh, – if he had a corner like Gilly in the past and he's backside one on one with the X instead of playing a cover three or making him playing some type of bail technique or whatnot. He has a guy that can play man, which allows him to do even more things with his defense and uh, open up some other doors that he might have in his system. You know, when it comes to man to man, everybody's not good at man to man. You know, people talk about the last D.C., and uh, how he didn't uh, blitz and then Gus come and he's worse than Gus. I mean, you're not going to blitz if you can't play man to man. If you don't have guys that can cover the, the wide receivers that you trust and man to man, it's hard. You know, it's hard to trust a guy during a blitz and you have a wide receiver with no help and it's, you're by himself. If you make any type of small mistake, any type of, you know, false step or anything and they pick up and read the blitz and they hit the right slant and the right execution, you know, it can hurt you. So, you know, a lot of times you'll see defensive coaches try to protect themselves on what they're weak at, you know, far as in the scheme wise. So if you don't have good pass rushers, but you got a good secondary, you'll see defenses that blitz a lot. You look at Ty Bowles with the Buccaneers, you look at, you know, guys that done that. He's he normally has great uh pass man to man cover guys, you know, within their systems. And normally they have to find pass rushers or find ways to develop uh, you know, pressure within the scheme, blitzing or whatever they got to do because they got the guys on the back end to cover it. But when you don't have guys that can get pressure and you don't have guys that can cover man to man, you're going to have some type of zone to where guys can kind of see the ball, have their eyes on the quarterback, see what's going on because they're going to play a lot faster that way than playing a weakness that they might not be great at or, or confident in in uh, those situations. All right. Well, I think we're coming pretty close to the end of this episode. Is there anything you want to discuss that we haven't covered so far today? 
Nah, not yet, but the summer's going to go by fast. And before you know it, training camp will be here and everything will be back to normal with the football. So I'm kind of kind of getting excited about that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, once, once football season kicks in, we're going to be doing this twice a week, uh, <laughs> bringing out reports. Uh, I think we'll start that on – I think we discussed it on on preseason games. Once the preseason games start, we'll we'll mm-hmm. we'll we'll do a a pregame situation and a postgame thing. So you know, Thursdays and Mondays or Thursday. I haven't got the schedule one hundred percent worked out yet, but keep an eye out on that. Uh, thanks again, Gerard, for for hanging out and giving us your insights. That's that's freaking awesome as usual. And until next time, man, I'm Lawrence Owen. That's Gerard Powers. This was Believe in Colts brought to you by Bet Online. And as usual, until next time, go Colts.